There are a couple of questions from you, and I've got one myself, so let's do those first before we look at what's new in the book. Questions come first from page 131, and we'll start with problem 15, see how that goes. Turns out this is actually a good warm-up for the kinds of things we're going to do today. You'll see why shortly. But this is a problem where, at least from our point of view now, it's not possible to get y isolated on one side of an equation in order to get a derivative. Uh, it is not explicit y is f of x, but it's what I call an implicit relationship between the two, f, and x, f of x and y, some function equal to a constant or zero. Obviously, I can put it in this form by subtracting x, y, and 1 from both sides. If you're in that situation with an implicit function, you use implicit differentiation. I guess that's the word we use. And the idea is that you simply take the prime of both sides, or the d of both sides, or whatever the notation is. But basically, if you have an equality, uh, the story is you will have equality after derivatives as well. Remembering that y is some unknown function of x, or at least one imagines that that's the case. Now the reason for that comes up immediately on the right-hand side. Let's do that first. Derivative of the sums is sum of derivatives. Derivative of x with respect to x is 1. Derivative of y with respect to x, it's not 1 because y is some, at this point, unknown function of x. So the best we can do is put down y prime plus 0. Derivative of a constant is 0. And on the left-hand side, I said this was something of a warm-up. And you can see it here. This is initially to be looked at as sine squared of some variable u, where u is itself a function of y, which is itself a function of x. So as it turns out, this is going to be two applications of the chain rule on the left-hand side. You'll get 2 sine of that u to the first power times the derivative of u, which is the derivative of 3y. That's 3y prime. So technically speaking, I think we had two chain rules there right before your very eyes. And that's why I think I can safely say chain rule is probably one of the most important rules among all of them, because it's almost always used. And I, as a teacher, am paid to stand here and at least say it a few times to begin with. But in a week or two, you won't hear it. I'll just start taking derivatives helter-skelter, and, and you'll not realize that the chain rule is really being used. But certainly, it is very fundamental. Now, for implicit differentiation, the whole purpose is to generate y primes here and there. And in this case, we have a couple of them. So it looks like, if I haven't made a mistake, y prime is that stuff on the right-hand side. Oops, not that stuff over there at all. I've got to take subtract y prime from both sides. OK, let me do that one first. 6 sine 3y minus 1 times y prime. OK, so I had a 6, y, six sine 3y y prime on the left. I had a single y prime on the right, so I subtract that. I'm left with just a 1 on the right-hand side. So again, uh, I hope you're careful enough to keep me honest. And uh, if I haven't made an algebraic mistake after this point, This ought to be the solution. Uh, typically, it has x's and y's in the answer. And uh, in this case, we don't have any x's, as a matter of fact, but that's OK. Any questions on that one? It's a little bit of everything. Sir? Yes. Could you just show us the chain rule once again? OK, chain rule. Let's pick out the one I used right here. What's really going on is that I need, let's 
same color here. I'm looking at sine squared 3y. I want the derivative of that. What I'm looking at is the derivative of sine, um, yeah, sine squared u is what I wrote down. Um, in fact, what I should have written down, I suppose, is something like this, v squared prime. I uh, didn't take it as many steps back as I could have. Uh, we're really looking first at something that's being squared, and then second, we're really looking at something that's a sine of something. So according to the chain rule, this would be 2v to the first, v prime, yep, prime here. Now v is the sine function, so this is 2 sine u, derivative of sine u. That's a good, good thing you asked me that question. Obviously, I made a big mistake over there. And finally now, we have 2 sine u, cosine u, u prime. And now, checking back what u was, uh, let's see, it was 3y, we get 3y prime. Thanks for stopping me. I hope to, uh, more of you would have, because I did make a, a mistake over here. When I took my derivative, I didn't do it right. That's just simply all I did at this point. It should have been 2 sine to the first derivative of a sine. So I should have had a cosine 3y in here, and then the derivative of u, which was the 3y prime. So all those steps over there, I missed all, a couple of them in order to get that, that factor right there. So to correct it out, let's see if I can stick this in. Let's put the cosine 3y here, and uh, also down here. Again, thanks for pointing that out. And also, it's a good advertisement for not cutting your step short. So once again, derivative of sine squared should have been 2 sine to the first, derivative of sine, which is cosine of the argument, derivative of the argument. So I guess there are really three chain rules. I forgot, forgot the first one, apparently. OK. Any more questions about that one? Let's try. Let me try again. This is 23 someone had a question about. I suppose, uh, if I remember right, I just wrote down the basic part of the problem. We were supposed to find the tangent line to the curve at this particular point. If not, we can, we can fudge it. So if that's the case, here may be the graph of that relationship. Notice that this may not be a single-valued function. It need not be, I should say. It's possible that your graph could wiggle all over the place. Uh, ex uh, an easy example of that, for example, is x squared minus y equals 0. Uh, I mean, let's square it the other way. That's what I wanted. x minus y squared equals 0. And that turns out to be not a function in the sense that for every x, there's a single value of y. You know, it's a double-branched function, if you like. So these things can indeed loop back on themselves. Apparently, the coordinates 2, 3 for a point Specify the point on the curve. Let's see if I can manufacture that point. Maybe that's it right there, P. And one should check that that's the case. Uh, if we ch put in x equals 2 and y equals 3 into that quantity, you should get something that's identically 0. Rather than do that, maybe I'll answer a question instead. <laughs> okay. Where, here? Yeah. Negative 3, okay. So I should have checked it, because I would have found out that's not the case. OK. So 2 minus 3 apparently lies on the curve. If you put x equals 2 and y equals 3 in, it should satisfy the equation. What we're looking for is that tangent line right there. And since we have a point, all we need is a slope. Typically, we've seen that day after day. 
Well, let's see if I can take an implicit derivative correctly once here. Starting from left to right, as we take the derivative of both sides, we'll get 6x squared minus, next we'll require the product rule, x squared y. If we take the derivative of the first, 2x times the second plus first derivative of second. And then a power rule for the y cubed. Don't forget the y prime. Derivative of 1 is 0. And all that is equal to 0. I'd like to point out a mistake that someone reminded me of in a previous section today. Since you've done this so long, you keep getting the feeling that every problem, when you have to take a derivative, starts out y prime equals something. And that's what I saw in the problem. Mysteriously, somewhere there's a y that popped up, and now the derivative just appeared. And that's not really correct. The whole point is that by taking implicit derivatives, y primes appear within expressions equal to one another. In this case, we only had a 0 on the right. But if there was something else over there, we'd have some y primes possibly pop up as well over there. The whole point is, is if you've taken the derivatives properly, then you can solve for y prime in terms of x and y. And now, in this problem, go on even further, stick in x and y to figure out what the slope is. What we have here is a negative x squared y prime and a positive 3y squared y prime. So let me take those out, leave them on the left side, and let's put everything else that we have, namely the minus 2xy becomes a plus 2xy on the right, and this x squared looks like it's a minus 6x squared on the right. Divide through by, one hopes, something that's non-zero. But at any rate, we are only interested at one specific pair of values anyway. And that's when we plug in x equals what was it, uh, 2, and as I was corrected, y equals minus 3. Plug those numbers in, they'll give you the slope. Uh, I think arithmetically, that's beyond my ability to compute. Let's just call that m once those numbers are plugged in. And after you've got m, then the story is the same as before. We would say that y minus the y value, which is minus 3, should be the slope m times x minus the x value. So once you have m, use the point slope form of the straight line, and then you'll have the equation that you need. It's too bad I had to skip over the point that is really different, and that is that your slope involves both x and y, but since you're given a point on the curve, you know exactly what x and y are, and you still can generate a number for that m. Okay, questions on that one? That looks Pretty standard, except, of course, it takes implicit derivatives to get, to get somewhere with it. Um, I think it, it would be difficult to try to solve this for y in terms of x. Someone had a question about that. You have a few problems where you can, and find, can indeed find y in terms of x, but that's generally not going to be the case. So that gets us through chain rule and implicit derivatives. I wanted to backtrack a little because I mentioned a problem. This was my question, I guess. I mentioned a problem last time that we needed to know something about fractional powers in order to solve, and that was the last section that we looked at. This problem stated there in your book on page 135, number 52, and I had a picture up on the board to start with at one time. Here's a pendulum. We'll assume it's a no air resistance, et cetera, et cetera. And it's swinging back and forth at some speed. And in fact, the time it takes for one complete oscillation is called the period of the pendulum, t. And what we'd like to do is to uh, change l, length, l, so that the period t I believe it says increases by 1%. Uh -huh. We 
we'd like to change the length L, obviously lengthen it, make it a little bit longer, so that the period increases by 1%. may not be obvious, other than this is in the section on fractional powers, that you want to go back to differentials, especially the percent, I think, might tip you off. We talked about percent error. And so that's where I'm going to pick up the problem, is to say what they're asking for is we want 0.01 to be the change in the period divided by the period. That's a 1 percent change. That's approximately dt over t by our analysis of increments versus differentials, changes in the curve as opposed to changes along a tangent line. And now to get to the next step, what we have to do is come up with some equation for t. That is given to you. I think it's 2 pi square root of L divided by G, and G is supposed to be gravitational constant about 32 in, uh, in the familiar system. So really what we're looking at is something that's a constant times L to the one-half. So as a function of L, it has a fractional power, and thereby we actually need that rule for taking fractional derivatives. I don't think I had it on the, the uh, board last time because I forgot. And you'll saw, you saw it in the book, I'm sure. The derivative of x to the m over n with respect to x is m over n x to the m over n minus 1. And then with chain rule, that allows us to take derivatives of fractional powers of functions as well. If we had a, a u in here, then we'd have u to the m over n minus 1 as well as a u prime by the chain rule. Our function is in terms of this variable L, so let me write it down. The thing on top would be the differential of what I need on the bottom, so let's call it 2 pi g to the minus 1 half L to the plus 1 half, and remembering that L is the only variable really. So I need the differential of the same thing on top. Here's t and dt. So on top, we'll have 2 pi g to the minus 1 half. Easy problem now. 1 half l to the minus 1 half dl. That's the numerator. Denominator, 2 pi g to the minus 1 half l to the 1 half. These constants go away. We can pull the L to the minus one-half in the denominator is L to the one. So we have DL over 2L. Okay, now let's recall what I wanted. I wanted, if you follow that line of equalities all the way up, and we need a double squiggle there, really, to make an approximation, we started out wanting 0.01 equaling what we just came up with dl over 2l. So that means dl over l is 0.02. And I think that's good enough, but I suppose the way the book would state it is that you'd like to change l, increase it, in fact, by 2 percent. Increase l by 2 percent, approximately. Actually, that goes the other way, doesn't it? So approximately change L by 2 percent, and you'll get what you desire. Now, if you have a, a hankering to see how close that really is, don't forget you could find delta T, exactly what it is. It would be 2 pi radical L plus delta L over G minus 2 pi radical L over G. And if you had some numbers in mind, you could plug those in and see what's going on. Or you could try to simplify it, although I think you'll find the square root sign kind of a mess. But that's the actual difference, which would give you, in some sense, if you could solve it for L in terms of delta T, would give you some idea of what the percentage change should be. What I'm really trying to say is that's really a pretty tough problem. And because we're talking about a small change, 0.01, I 
I trust that the answer is pretty close down here, really pretty close to 2%. So regardless of what L is, make a 2% increase in it, and you've got what you need. Question? No, sir, by, uh, by taking it there in that one final step, uh, 2 pi, no, sir, 1 up. Okay. Yes, sir, by uh, keeping a DL in the numerator, does that keep you from having to take the rest of the derivative? Not really. I've See, I'm taking a differential of T. Here's a question. And here's, I guess, is the answer to the question. What I'm saying is that I'm taking T prime times DL. This is the formal definition of what a differential is. In fact, if you divide both sides by DL, then we get that other look at a derivative as a quotient of differentials. But now I'm talking about actual changes of variables as opposed to rates of change. It's slightly different. We're talking about how much T changes as opposed to how is it changing with respect to L. That's just two different looks at the same problem, but they're two different ideas. So the answer to your question is this is D of this quantity equaling T prime times DL. And of course, you want that DL to come out. That's the whole, really, the purpose of the problem. OK, anything else on that one? I thought it was kind of interesting. Again, it's a little bit of review on differentials, but it requires some chain rule and uh, fractional powers. OK, the lecture material for today is pretty straightforward, and it's somewhat repetitious. So. If you've got some questions, feel free to fire away because uh, you're going to see the same thing over and over again in one way or another. We're in section 3.9, and let me have you give me an example. So I'll show you what we're after. So give me a middle and hard problem in derivatives. Can you think up something? Mr. Rogers? Uh, 3x squared plus x squared y squared. Um, I don't want to implicit it yet. Give me a trig function then. Plus cosine squared. Okay. That's probably pretty good. So typical problem for taking derivatives, you go ahead and you take your derivative, 6x plus, I'm glad you asked me this one. That's the one I messed up last time. This is 2 cosine to the first of x times the derivative of cosine. And in this case, since the argument is x, x prime is just a 1 out there, the phantom 1. So out of the, all of this, I've got 6x minus 2 sine x cosine x. All this new section is about is to take so-called higher order derivatives. Which means in this problem, Mr. Rogers gave me, they're asked, asking you, or he asked me, to find y double prime. y double prime, as you might imagine, if you had to imagine something, is y prime, that function, prime. It's a derivative of the derivative. And we will see shortly that if y is some type of linear distance function, well, knowing that y prime is velocity, it's interesting to look at y double prime as the acceleration, rate of change of velocity with respect to time. Right above it sits y prime, so this is a fairly easy problem. 6 minus 2, here comes product rule. Derivative of sine is a cosine times a cosine plus sine derivative of cosine. And so y double prime is 6 minus 2 cosine squared x minus sine squared x. And since it's not too bad looking, what do you think y triple prime is? The derivative, the derivative. The derivative. We already have a couple of them here. 
So it's y double prime prime. And now we need to take this derivative over here. It'd be a minus 2 quantity 2 cosine to the first times derivative of cosine minus 2 sine to the first derivative of sine. What do we have here? Uh, minus 4 times 2. Looks like a minus plus 8, right? Sine x, cosine x. And then you could keep on going, unless I missed something there. OK. I suppose that's, uh, I'm, I'm not really a good example, but I suppose that's why I keep saying you should be good at taking derivatives, because once in a while, you've got to take two or three. And I pity you if you've made a mistake in the first one, because obviously, things will get wrong, if not very difficult, in terms of uh, the formulation. The same thing is true over here. I think we'll see a problem a little bit later on. But it may be, as Mr. Rogers was trying to pose to me, a problem that requires implicit differentiation to get to the first derivative. And now, a second derivative is really implicit differentiation again, except we have a y prime on one side. So y double prime would involve a quotient rule within which you'll find some y primes. And then you'll substitute in for those y primes. I look at a problem that's in your book, but while this was up here, I thought I'd mention it. You may have to use implicit differentiation as well for these higher derivatives. Let's take a look at just a selection of problems right out of the book, like number 6 on page 137. This is a function of s, k of s is s squared plus 4 to the 2 thirds. I think we're supposed to find the second derivative. First, notice that it's a fractional power, so we're going to have to use that fractional power rule to begin with. k prime of s will be 2 thirds, the quantity, to 2 thirds minus 1 times the derivative of the quantity, which would be a 2s. Okay, So we could write this as 4 thirds s, s squared plus 4 to the minus 1 third. Now, some of you may want to put that negative exponent factor down in the denominator. My personal feeling is perhaps you do not. I prefer to use a fractional negative power rather than a quotient rule in taking derivatives. And uh, in this particular case, I think it'll be a little bit cleaner if you do it as a product rule. Now, as someone pointed out earlier, sometimes if you don't use the same rule the book does, you'll get an answer that looks nothing like the one in the back. They should be equivalent, but it may be not be so obvious that they are. Um, not much I can say about that other than you could try it a different way and see if it works out. But uh, that very often is the case. So here I'm going to use product rule, where perhaps many of you would prefer to use a quotient rule. And we'll probably get different answers. That product has derivative 1 times the second term plus the first term times the derivative of the second. Now that's all of this. So again, I'm going to use power rule and chain rule. That's a minus 1 third s squared plus 4 to the minus 4 thirds, looks like, times the derivative of what's inside, which is 2s. So let me check that out again. 4 thirds out front, derivative of first times the second plus first term derivative of a second. And that's just like the original problem almost. Power, quantity to the one less power, of what's inside. Now, if you're not asked for a third derivative, you might as well leave it that way. If you have to find a third derivative, you probably will want to simplify. You could take out a, a common power of s squared plus 4, if you wish, and maybe work at it that way. But that's as far as you need to go. OK, 
Okay, you can see the problems generally tend to get a little more complicated just by chance, I guess, Mr. Rogers' example over here, in fact, got a little bit simpler as time went on. In fact, what you'll find is a few problems that involve polynomials, and I suspect that uh, if you look at them long enough, you'll see that polynomials get simpler as you take more and more derivatives. Okay, that also reminded me that, speaking of polynomials, of a question someone had that appeared in this, this last problem. Let me regress and do that one. Someone asked about one of your homework problems, which was page 134. Uh, forget the number even. G of W is W squared minus 4W plus 3 divided by W to the 3 halves. That problem over there reminded me that, again, I don't like the quotient rule, although sometimes you really don't have much choice. But in many situations, I'll force it to be non-quotient rule. And I think in this case, it might be preferable to consider this as a product of that polynomial times w to the minus 3 halves. In fact, you could multiply through. This is w to the 4 halves. w to the minus 3 halves minus 4 w to the 1 w to the minus 3 halves plus 3 w to the minus 3 halves. And you can see what's coming. When someone showed me this problem at the beginning of the hour today, using the quotient rule, you get a gigantic expression because of the numerator, of course. And if you handle this in terms of fractional powers, you can handle each term very quickly, just term by term. Now, this turns out to be an ultra simplification. I won't claim it's always that way. It wouldn't be that way. For example, I had a w plus 1 to the 3 halves or something like that. But nonetheless, I really think I would push looking at anything that might be a product rule as a product and use the quotient as a last resort. So without going any further, I can s you can see that the fractional powers here, you can handle straightforward, in a straightforward way. OK, let's take a look at back to page 137, one of these implicit derivative problems. I think it's number 30, 24. 